I'm going to, uh, I'm calling this message the prophetic, the prophetic context of the church, the place where the church finds himself in. It's not an easy place. Next year, I think it's October, we will complete a 500 year of the reformation of Martin Luther. And uh, you remember Martin Luther, um, he, he went to all the churches and he nailed at every door the 95 statements. This is a political statement actually, but what Martin Luther was actually saying to the church, I have discovered 95 mistakes in the doctrines of the church. And I am inviting the Pope that we can discuss these 95 mistakes that was in the church of his time. I can say prophetically to you today that these lists have grown over the years and there are now more mistakes in the church. And for that reason, it is important, crucial, that God must now send a new wave of reformation into the earth to correct the mistakes that is in the church. I call this message the prophetic context of the church because I'm going to speak mostly prophetically in this place. When the Holy Spirit comes over me, I become prophetic. Now, just for Cape Town, just for Cape Town, the Lord is saying that he has given all the major cities in South Africa their time. But he has preserved Cape Town for such a time as this. Please take the prophetic word. And again, the Lord said this new move, and I want to correct this. When I was young, 15 years, 16 years in the house of the Lord, I had that understanding and I was taught that way that a revival will come to South Africa. It will come from Cape Town and from here it will go all, all over the world. I need to correct this today in the light of the new movements of God. It will not be a revival. It will be a reformation that will sweep all over the earth. Please also take note of that. I'm just giving you prophetic statements here today. This new move, the Lord said, he will start to build it in South Africa first. And he said, on all the coastal cities of South Africa, they will, he will build the prophetic and the apostolic ministries in Cape Town, in uh, KZN, Eastern Cape, and all the coastal borders of South Africa. And from here, it will move inland and it will affect the whole nations of the earth. When I was in the stage, uh, specifically to Dr. Sam, they said to us that America may be, when it comes to the economy, may be first world, and South Africa third world. But it went, when it comes to the building of church and the advancement of the body of Christ, South Africa is a first world church. Also take note of that. And so we, we have Americanized the church in such a way that the gospel don't look like the Bible anymore. It looks like America. And God wants to correct that. And God is raising up voices that your ears is not used to. And please take note that we must adjust our ears because new voices are rising in the earth. And to the lighthouse specifically, I say this, the time has come for the lighthouse. The set time to favor the lighthouse once again has come. The road will not be easy, but it will be possible because a great transition, a mass migration of all the hearts and the minds in this house must change to accommodate the new things and the new sayings of God in South Africa. Please take these prophetic words. And I'm going to remain in this message and I'm going to 
remain in the prophetic flow this morning to explain to you the things that God wants to do and the things that need to be corrected in South Africa. If you do a case study on the journey in the desert, you will see that God was up front. He himself was the leader of that journey, not Moses. He himself was up front by giving them a pillar by night and a cloud by day. No one will lead this reformation. God himself will lead this reformation. Hallelujah. Amen. God will not allow any movement, any person to contaminate what God wants to do. And in their journey, the, the God gave them a pillar by night, a cloud by day, meaning that God wants to make sure that they will travel 24-7. Nothing must stop them. He even gave them a divine thermal step to make sure that even at night they will continue, they will travel. And this is the work and the spirit of the season. God wants to make sure that the mission of the evolution of the church will not stop and nothing will stop the move of God in South Africa and in the rest of the world. So God has activated something new in the spirit. And now I, I visited a lot of, um, uh, I'm invited to a lot of pastors, breakfasts and so on in the city. And everybody is saying that God is doing something new. My frustration is that nobody can decode or decipher what is this new thing that God is doing. But I am here and I say, please open your eyes and listen to the Spirit of the Lord this morning. I, please turn with me uh, to Matthew 16, and we're going to read from verse 13 to 19. A very famous scripture. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was questioning his disciples, saying, Who do men pronounce me, the Son of God, to be? So they said, Some say you are John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and yet others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you pronounce me to be? And Simon Peter, who is an apostolic figure, answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When there's a prophetic, when there's an apostolic grace in the earth, the first responsibility of that grace is to reveal Christ to the church. And Peter has a correct understanding of the person standing in front of him, and he said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because the idea of apostles is to go into the mind of Christ uh, and bring out the blueprints uh, from the heavens and make it known to the church. So as prophets are dealing with the heart of God, apostles are dealing with the mind of Christ and bring the mind of Christ to the church. Jesus, verse 17, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Once again, you will see it is only the Father that can reveal the Son. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, this revelation or this confession, I shall build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. It's a powerful, powerful conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Before I go into that, uh, because of the sake of time, I would like to give you a list of things uh, that lacks in the body of Christ. And over the, the years that will come, um, we will discuss 
and God will um, give more uh, revelation on these things. For those who are making notes, I'm going to give you a list in explaining the prophetic context of the church, giving you a list of things that needs to change in the body of Christ. Uh, number one, that the present day Christianity is insufficient. I say this again. Present day Christianity is totally insufficient. We cannot deal with the challenges that is on the horizon. The church is not built for the challenges because once again as we enter into a new season, uh, gone are the days that we will keep ourselves busy uh, with ground uh, uh, forces of Satan because when apostles comes into the earth, apostles don't deal with the ground forces of the enemy. Apostles deal with the parliament of Satan and bring down the legislative body of the enemy meaning that we are going to deal with the philosophies and the ideologies of the world system and bring it down and under the feet of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is, it is crucial that we allow the apostles to come back into the body of Christ because only the apostles can deal with the parliament of Satan, the legislative body of Satan, and destroy that. So present-day Christianity is totally insufficient. Number two, the lack of correct and powerful expression of the kingdom, I'll go into that later on. There is insufficient and inadequate leadership right now in the body of Christ. The structures and the functions of churches must be redefined from a kingdom perspective. There's lack of oneness in the body of Christ. We don't believe in, uni in unity. We don't believe in union. We only believe in oneness. Um, there's a lack of true fathers in the body of Christ. A lack of true fathers in the body of Christ. And we now know that the wineskin of the season, the structure of the season, has changed. If you can't, if you can't see uh, uh, Pastor Peter as your spiritual father, uh, it's going to be a confrontation in the spirit that will never end. There's a switch. You can't see yourself as a member of the lighthouse anymore. You must see yourself as a son of Peter Suleiman. Amen. Let me correct this and put it into a right context later on. Uh, there's also a lack of organic growth in the church meaning that there are too much institutionalized systems in the church that kills the very life of Christ that is in us. And we have to deal with this. Um, there's too much traditions, too much traditions in the church. Traditions has become law in our churches. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Um, there's a lack of accurate doctrine in the body of Christ. If you study the church, if you study scripture, there is no room in the Bible for any doctrine but apostolic doctrine. According to Acts 2 verse 42, and they gave themselves, they devoted themselves to apostolic doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. That's the culture of the church. Uh, so that we will emerge ourselves in these four statements or principles and bringing to us apostolic doctrine to the church. In theological circles, they will call all the letters of Paul and all these writers the pastoral letters. But these letters were not written by, apost by, by pastors, they were written by apostles. Yeah. So it is apostolic letters, not pastoral letters. We need to correct that in our theology. You see, it is like this. If you go to a doctor and the doctor gives you a prescription, you can't, I don't care how many degrees a lawyer had, but you can't go to a lawyer with that description. You need to find someone in medicine because I can't answer when a doctor ate market. So you have to go to someone in the field of medicine to interpret what the doctor was writing on the prescription. 
Now I'm asking you, is it correct? If apostles are the authors of the New Testament, why do we go to pastors to interpret apostolic letters? And so we have to change, I'm telling you, a total change of the structures of the church needs to take place and allow apostles, once again, that spirit to interpret the Bible for us. God has never, never given professors at university the right to, 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 to write doctrine for the church. Only apostles has the right to write doctrine for the church. It is apostolic doctrine. So our teachings will, will once again, it will go. I can't explain to you the massive changes that is it's on its way to the body of Christ. But we will change from apostolic wineskin in the church to prophetic and apostolic wineskins. And that in itself is a major, major discussion in the body of Christ. Um, we have to rede redefine repentance in the body of Christ. What, what it means, because John the Baptist, he came on the scene and he said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And by making that statement, we know there was a 400 years of silence between the New Testament and the Old Testament. John the first voice, whenever God wants to do something new, he always used a prophetic voice to break the silence over creation and over the church. And right now, God is bringing in prophetic voices to break the, 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 the uh, a silence that is hanging over the church right now. And pro prophets will always come and say, repent. Repent, it's nothing to do with smoke and adultery. That's only the symptoms of sin. When God say repent, it means a mass move from an old order to a new order. Because when John was saying repent, he was not speaking to sinners. He was speaking to the church of Moses. The, church, the, the, the children of the Lord coming from that dispensation, that economy, and a, and, a, and a shift needs to take place into the new. And he said, we call this a repentance. So there are things now that the body of Christ needs to repent. To come into a new season, we need repentance. Renounce the old things. Moving on into new things. I'm just giving you a list. I'm not in my word, I'm just giving you a list. Um, the need for total reformation. Because if the, even the reformation of 500 years, 500 years is not enough to give us a correct view of who Christ is. So even after 500 years, that was an incomplete reformation of Martin Luther. Therefore, God once again is visiting the earth. Uh, there will be a new definition of the apostolic ministry. Um, and the church must familiarize themselves with genuine apostolic operations in the earth. And then there's an absence of governmental mindset in the body of Christ. An absence of governmental mindset in the earth. I'm going to be governmental and I'm going to be very confrontational uh, this morning. Very confrontational with you. And then the purpose of the church must be redefined. Because the church is no more the church of Jesus Christ. And he himself, the owner of the church, he now stands at the door and knock and ask for religious people permission to come into his own church. And God wants to change that. Uh, and he, God, God, is, God, God will not set up, he will not, he will not associate himself with the foolishness that goes on in the body of Christ. And he wants his church back. And for that reason, he is now bringing out of his bosom the apostles to usher in a new dimension of Christ so that he can be God again in his church. Now, as we are going into redefining the church, what is the things that needs to be restored to the church today? And I can tell you now, I am just uh, like a front runner this morning. I'm just like a front runner. I believe 
as uh, Pastor Sneiman is positioning himself to transition this house, more voices will come. And I'm laying a foundation for all the other voices that will come. They will speak on these issues when they come into this house. Now, this is the things that needs to be restored to the body of Christ. Number one, the removal of corporate blindness. The removal of corporate blindness. Did you study the life of Christ? He healed many people, even raising up the dead. But there was one, there was one disease in his time, and that was blindness. And once again, blindness is in the body of the, of, of the church of, of Jesus Christ, and God wants to deal with corporate blindness in the body. Uh, accurate movement of the body of Christ that needs to be restored, and then the drastic overall of its internal operating systems. Uh, and then this is very important to restore the central message of Christianity, which is Christ and Christ alone. Uh, a movement towards change in church government and structures, doctrine and practices that conform to the biblical norm rather than church tradition. And then the restoring, restoring the apostolic and prophetic ministry uh, to become the strategy for establishing new churches as well as leading existing ones. And the last one here is the release of an entirely new dimension of ministry and the break with the traditions of old. You know, when John said repent, can you imagine, uh, to make it more clear to you, when John said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, thousands, thousands of years of a certain kind of religious practice, just with that statement, he, he actually brought it to an end. Um, and, I mean, if this is your paradigm, if this is your, this is your mindset, that I stand up in the morning, um, I take my offering, my lamp or my whatever, my, my ox, my goat, take it to the priest, he will slaughter it, um, stand in the gap for me, for my forgiveness, and so on. And doing all the rituals, going through all the seven feasts of Israel, year after year, thousands of years, practicing all these things. And suddenly, suddenly, here comes a voice out of the wilderness saying, these practices become irrelevant. Uh, it will not be practiced anymore. I'm saying this in 2016, 21st century church. What if God is now coming into our realm? saying now to the body of Christ, what you have practiced up till this day has now become irrelevant. All our pro pro program has become redundant. God has no pleasure in it anymore because it distorts the view of Christ. Uh, all our programs is so loaded that people can't see Christ anymore. They only see programs. They only see traditions. They only see activities. Christ is like banished out of his church. And he said, I want my church back. This is our understanding in the apostolic season of repentance. Now, let me turn to my scripture reading. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to discuss, discuss with you this morning things that I believe uh, will delay or even stop uh, the process of our migration uh, the transition of the church can be stopped by certain behavior patterns, certain uh, attitudes, and certain practices in the body of Christ. And we will never reach that destination called Christ. If you ask me what is our destination, our destination is God himself. Um, so I'm going to start for those who are making notes. Uh, time is running fast. Uh, listen to this church and take this into consideration. Right now, and God wants to deal with this, with this issue here, that there is a heavy focus 
on the conduct of a successful service. A heavy focus on the conduct of a successful service. Saying that Sunday is our highlight of the week. And I, I, I'm saying to you when the apostles are coming in, that Sunday will no more be our highlight of the week. Every day will be our highlight. Amen. And God will deal with this. The focus to think when we have a successful service on a Sunday morning, this is our highlight. God will destroy that mindset. But in saying this, I grew up in a very traditional Pentecostal environment and I, I cherish my upbringing in the Lord. If you cut me open, you will see and study my DNA. I am Pentecostal deep inside of me. But I also realize I must move on. Amen. The Bible said and it was the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is only a day. Don't make it a lifestyle. Don't make it your life. Amen. It was the day of Pentecost. It's only a day. Supposed to be a day in your life. Now, in saying this, heavy focus on the conduct of a successful service. So we must ask ourselves that, what is our definition of a successful service? If this service is over, how are we going to rate this gathering to say it was a successful service? Now, I know um, in my Pentecostal upbringing and in my community where I grew up, this is our view of a successful service. And it is interesting to, to notice that our views are not the same. If you are evangelistic, then you will believe that a successful service is how many people are in the church this morning. And if every if there is a person on every chair, we will clap hands and say, bravo, what a successful service. The service was jam-packed. I'm telling you, this mindset is a false mindset in a new season, and that, it, that mindset will delay the movement of the church. Also, the size of the offering. There are churches that are, they are motivated by offerings. And if the people who, who, uh, who is uh, dealing with the finances come in the office and say, Pastor, this is the offering this morning. Well, if he smiles, then they're happy. If he don't smile, then they know it was not a successful service. <laughs> because this is the mindset. So this is their definition of a successful service. What was the size of the offering? I'm saying to you, God is going to deal with these things. Because the days are coming that God is going to place a moratorium on finances in the church. And if you don't know him as father, and you don't see him as the source, then we're going to have big trouble in the body of Christ. And then there are other churches who are moved by worship and think a successful worship service was the success of the church because they built their churches on music. Um, and they built, and they think uh, music will draw the numbers. Music, you know, um, I, I don't have time to go into this. Um, I'm following this message the last 20 years. We were a good-sized church of about 500 members. When God was finished with us, there was only 40 left. It was not a demotion, it was a promotion. Uh, because then, I gave God an opportunity, and he gave me a fresh opportunity to build his church and not my church. Amen? Because I'm very good in building churches. But then, God said, yes, it's your church, it's not my church. And if you today give back that 40 people back to me, then I will show you what I will do. And uh, we're not a big church. We are 400 plus people right now. And I believe everyone that is now in our ministry is a gift from God. Now, I'm saying this because we built around music. 
Our choir alone was about 100 voices, and the worship team was about 24 members, and that was music, music, music. Um, and, and then God starts to speak. I start to see that you are singing the Lord's songs with the spirit of the world, and you are giving us Babylonian worship on this stage, and I have to deal with the spirit of entertainment on this stage, singing in the nightclubs and coming to sing the songs of the Lord on a Sunday morning, and I have to put in the whoop, and I start to, uh, start to lose members, but this is the standard of the Lord. And so uh, losing these people, I find myself for seven years without a worship team. But that seven years was our best worship in the church. Because no instruments coming from the Spirit, <clears throat> like uh, Pastor Peter said, no words on the screen. You are forced now to come. Something must come out of your spirit. And for seven years, no music instrument, uh, just pure worship coming out of the spirits of the people. Right now, God has given us a good worship team, but uh, just to show me that we're not going to build a new season on music. And this is not our barometer, it's not worship. And then there are churches. Um, they have built the churches, especially around the gifts, and especially around these two gifts, the gifts of healing and the gifts of prophecy. People will sit here, and they will start to realize God has given them a, a gift, and they break away from the church and start a ministry on a gift. You have no right to start a ministry on a gift. Let me tell you this. Only the fivefold ministry has the right to establish churches. And these churches are not established on gifts. I cannot bring in a prophetic gift and start a ministry with it. I cannot bring in a healing gift and start a ministry with it. What you see on national or international television, God will shut it down one of these days. What's this? What, what are they saying in social media? What's the space? <laughs> God at work. And so this is our understanding sometimes uh, of what is a successful service. If this is our view, it's a false view, it's false expectation. And God uh, will deal with us when it comes to these issues. Now, I, the scripture, I'm going back to my scripture reading now because this is actually what Jesus was saying. Oh, he was, he was asking the question, who do men pronounce me, the son of God, to be? So they say, some say John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and yet others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but but who do you pronounce me to be? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, listen to this. He said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you study this correct, you will see the revelation of church is preceded by a correct definition of Christ. You can't have church first and then Christ. Christ first and then church. If you have the other way around, you're going to build something that God never asked you to build. So a correct definition of who Jesus is, and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the loving God. Now, he wants to make sure, and then Jesus make a statement. He said, Peter, Upon this confession, on this revelation, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, when Jesus, when he made that statement, Jesus was still part of the Old Testament church. So their meeting place, the church was a foreign concept. There was no such thing as a church. There was only a synagogue. So Jesus was a member of the synagogue and it, he himself opened up the scroll in the synagogue and started to read the scroll. He was part of something, but while he was part of something, his eyes was on something else. And he said, I'm going to build not a synagogue, I'm going to build a church. A major shifting. Now God is, 
Now, and then he asked, on the, he said to Peter, on this revelation, I will build my church on that correct understanding of who I am. Now, Peter, I'm giving you the right and I'm giving you the keys and to open up the kingdom and, and build me a church, not a synagogue. If the church of Jesus Christ don't have a correct view of who Christ is, we then can build anything and corrupt the church of Jesus Christ. We need first a correct understanding of who he is. Then we can build the church of Jesus Christ and not the other way around. Therefore, you cannot build a church on a gift. We build church on apostolic doctrine because the doctrines, it's not a set just of teachings. It is not academical. But when we talk about doctrine, doctrine is Christ himself. And so we build on the doctrines of Jesus Christ because he himself is the doctrine. Because he said he himself is the word. And so we need a correct understanding of who Christ is. And listen, this sounds so easy, but you know, there was this little boy. He, you know, when we were, when we were young, the neighbors, they had a big uh, fruit tree, and he looked at it. He was so tempted by the fruits. But his father said to him, boy, please don't jump over the fence. Our neighbors is going to kill us. And by the way, there's a big dog on the other side. That dog will rip you apart. And so the boy looked at the fruits and he said, today I'm going to take that chance. So he jumped over the wall, grabbed the fruit back to their side. No dog. Next day, he said, okay, I'm going to try it again. Jump over the fence, take more fruit, jump back again. No dog. One day he realized there's no dog. <laughs> the neighbors don't have a dog. Now, but now he was moved by fear because of the speakings of his father. But there was no dog. And then he started, now when, when you say there was no dog, but in his mind there was a dog. Because his father said so. Now that dog, we call it then in his mind a myth. Because it never existed. All the gods in the Bible is a myth. Except our God. If you study. Now, why am I saying this? Because we have created a mythological Christ in the church. And make the people believe that the Christ that we proclaim to them is Christ. And we built a Christ with incorrect doctrine. We built a Christ with programs. We built a Christ uh, with church tradition and all these things. And we present that Christ to the church and we expect the, the church to bow before the Christ that we have created for them. And actually, it is a false Christ. And this is the season where God wants to deal with a false Christ, a Christ that is in the body of Christ. I, I went to, uh, uh, to Brazil, uh, me and my wife, and in Brazil I said, okay, let's visit uh, the statue of Christ. And as I was standing in front of the statue of Christ, the people was making that, I can't do it, but they, <laughs> and, um, and as I was standing, suddenly the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. The Holy Spirit said to me, this is not, this is not Christ, this is a false Christ. The days are coming that I'm going to destroy this Christ. And let me tell you something. And you can make a mark of this. The day when you see on the news something badly has happened with that statue, then you must know that the Christ in Brazil, God has destroyed the false Christ that is in that nation. And the Lord said, I'm going to send my apostles and prophets to deal with the false Christ. It is only when you go to the, to, the, to the beach and the shopping centers that you can see the outward manifestation of that false Christ. Now, there's many false Christs in the church, even in South Africa, uh, how we present Christ to the church. And, the, and the, the church don't have a crystal clear view of who this Christ is. 
And when I use the word Christ, I'm not referring to Jesus because Jesus and Christ is not the same thing. <coughs> uh, that your pardon. When, when we say Jesus, we are referring to a man. When we use the word Jesus Christ, we are referring to his ascended position. When we use the word Christ, we are referring to his un eternal position. So this is three different things. So he said, you are the Christ, not Jesus or Jesus Christ. He said, you are the Christ, meaning that you are the eternal one. You are the one who created time, but live outside of it. You created Genesis, but you're not part of Genesis. You don't understand this. You existed before time. Before there was a Monday and a Sunday, Jesus has no understanding of what is Monday and Tuesday. Because he is the dateless, the timeless, the eternal one. He is the one, according to the Bible, according he is he is priest or high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And the Bible said that Melchizedek, he has no mother and he has no father. So Jesus comes from an economy where there's no concept of mother, no concept of father. He is fatherless, he is motherless, he is dateless, he is just the eternal one. Before everything existed, this Christ existed. I'll put it to you this way. Our genesis is not Adam. We must not go into replacement theology. Your genesis is Christ. Because you were found in Christ before you were found in, in Adam. Amen. Not in Christ. Not in Adam. But you came out of Christ. So you, you don't came out of Adam. You were found in Christ before you were lost in Adam. Understand it this way. And so our Genesis then, our Genesis cannot be Adam. So I will not trace my roots from Adam. I trace my roots from the eternal place. When I was in the bosom, in the spirit of Christ, long before there was a South Africa. Amen. Amen. This is your place. And, Paul, and, and when Peter said, you are the Christ, he said, this is what I see. You are. You are the eternal one. Uh, we were not lost uh, in you. We were found in you. I am lost in Adam, but not in you. So you are my genesis. And they said, on that revelation, I can now build my church, Peter. And I give you the keys. Um, Pastor Peter, I'm going to invite myself back to the lighthouse because <laughs> I'm serious I, I, can't, I can't complete this message I'm only, I stuck here with just this one thing called the heavy focus on the conduct of a successful service and so um, he said I will build my church so when we talk about building we talk about governmental issues in the church, and he said that the gates of Hades uh, shall not prevail against this church. Now, the gates of Hades, we know it's a demonic system. Listen, I believe the same way you believe that hell is fire. I, I want to put this on record hell is fire. This is my understanding now. But I also believe that hell is a system of wisdom. Hell is a system. A system of wisdom. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Why the gates of Hades? You know, when you start study the word Babel or Babylon, it means gate of gods. Whenever a god wants to come into our realm, he will look for a Babylonian gate to come into the earth. Yeah. And the Bible said that the gates of Hades, in other words, the gate of that demonic system of wisdom, 
shall not overtake the wisdom of the church. This is the understanding here of Hades. And he said that that system that Satan has set up, because listen, when you see Satanists or a home cell of Satanists in your community, don't be fooled by that. That's only a smokescreen. The real church of Satan is our educational system, is our political system, our legislative body, uh, the sport, economy. That's the church of, of Satan, the real church of Satan. It is in these institutions that Satan will corrupt these institutions to force his agenda through because he's looking for a gate to work through. Now, this is the point now here. If this is the understanding of a gate, then it means that our God is also looking for a gate to come from his realm to our realm. And he said, my church is my gate. If I want to communicate to the earth, if I want to send messages to the earth, I want to use my church. But if my church don't have a correct understanding of who Christ is, they will not know if that message comes, if that message is from Christ. And therefore we have to purify the church from wrong and erroneous doctrines, cleanse the church so that we can have a correct understanding of Christ because when the angels ascend and descend into our realm that we must know this is God visiting the church. And I say to the light of this morning, once again God is ascending and descending into the earth. Because God is now busy to establish the church once again as his gate to bring the messages from heaven and from here go deeper into the church. Uh, and, and, and if you ask me now this morning then, what is then a successful service this morning? Then we are saying if we can allow the Lord to come and descend from his realm into our realm and make this gathering a gate for God to come in and allow the word of God to speak into the hearts of men. That then is a successful service. Amen. Amen. We must give the word of God preeminence. Nothing must dominate our programs than the word of God. It is very disrespectful when we, then the worship is an hour and the word is ten minutes. We are saying we don't value the word of God. And because of that, the church cannot move on. These things will delay us. It will delay the movement and the migration of the church. And so we have to bring a correct understanding of Christ. Meaning, if we are going to have Sunday school, then Christ must be the center of it. We have now go back and bring the correct understanding of Christ to the children. And bring a Christocentric Sunday school into our gatherings. And not that, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, but that, that diluted form of the story of David and Goliath. Give them the true principles of David and Goliath. It is not for you to, to decide if they understand or not. When the Holy Spirit starts to speak, even children will understand. Amen. Amen. And so, when we now say, this is our youth department, same story. Same story. Youth is not a come together for entertainment and looking for a boyfriend and a girlfriend. <laughs> Amen? Uh, we must bring Christ as the center of the gatherings and ask the youth, what are you seeing in that youth gathering? When that service is over, they must say, we have seen the Lord. Amen? Amen? In all our gatherings a correct understanding of who this Christ is so that all our gatherings must be a gate for God to come into our gatherings and establish his name and make him Lord again over his church. Amen. Amen. And so the church have to change this. He said, and, 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 and I say, and I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of Hades the gates of Hades means uh, the philosophical systems, the ideological systems, the principles of a Babylonian system will not take over the church because when apostles come, one of the characteristics of apostles, they come with great wisdom in, in the midst of, 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 of crisis and 
um, complexity, the apostles come and bring a wisdom that is greater than the wisdom of, of the satanic system. Right now, church, if you open your eyes and, and, and prophets come to expose the Babylonian system in the church, how we run church on secular principles, uh, on business principles, church, and we think we are clever, but this is systems out of darkness, taken over the church of Jesus Christ, bringing in management principles from the world, and we call it order, and we call it organization. Christ is not interested in this. And we, f and we flood the church with new age principles, uh, and we don't even know it. And so God is coming, in, and by doing that, we are actually building, uh, uh, we are building a throne for Satan in the house of God, and we don't even know it. So God is about to deal with these false systems, false expectations, and false dimensions of the Christ that is in our heavenly place. I'm going to, this one I'm going to do fast, four minutes. Um, the, second, the second thing that will delay the body of Christ, a strong expectation of traditionally defined proper pastoral behavior patterns. Let me repeat this again. Strong expectation of traditionally defined Proper pastoral behavior patterns. What does that mean for the body of Christ? Pastor, please come and bless me. Pastor, please pray for me. Pastor, will you please dedicate my children? Pastor, will you please come and perform my whatever, whatever, whatever? And if, Pastor, if you don't visit me in the hospital, I'm not coming to church anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pastoral behavior patterns. Uh, I'm not coming to church because I was waiting and waiting for elder so and so and elder so is not, and I'm not coming to church until elder so and so come to the church or even pastor. Now that pas pastoral behavior patterns that is in the body of Christ will kill the movement to the finish. And we will not arrive at our desired destination because of these pastoral behavior patterns that is right now in the body of Christ. And God is about to deal uh, with the body, with all these things. Listen, don't get me wrong. I'm just using house visitation as an example. But let, let me explain it to you this, this way. I, 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 as a pastor, I believe in house visitations. I strongly believe in that. I, I, whenever I visit people, I can see it lifts their spirit. Uh, they love the presence uh, to be in their houses and so on. Listen, but if you are 20 years with the Lord, 20 years with the Lord, and that is still your expectation, something is seriously wrong with you. I'm telling you now. And you, you, you sit and wait for pastor to visit. That's a false expectation. Huh? And I'm telling you, you are going to delay the ministry because of that false uh, expectation and because of your lack of maturity. Now, shepherding in this season, I'm going to, I'm, I, 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 I said in my opening words, I'm going to give you a prophetic context of the church. In this new season, shepherding have shifted because the apostolic don't deal so much with immaturity. Because the idea of the apostles is bring us to a perfect place in Christ. Amen. And, and I mean shepherding now. We must now, where we are, we must now allow the word of God to shepherd us. And not waiting for a phys physical person anymore to shepherd us. Uh, because the word wants to shepherd us. It looks like this. When you, lis when you listen on a Sunday morning, to the speaker here. You must have the spiritual ability to carry every word uh, over that doorpost and take that word into your Monday and into your Tuesday. No, and when challenges come, you don't pick up the phone and ask for a shepherd. You must say to yourself, what was the word on Sunday? And you take that word and say, yes, this is what pastor said, I'm going to take that word. You know what you do? You allow the word to shepherd you. Without the presence of a physical person. 
This is the next development in the body of Christ. How mature Christians can allow the word to shepherd them. And listen, this is not new. It is not new. Because Jesus, when he was in the earth, he, he you study him, he will, whenever something happens or a question comes up, he will always refer back to the law and the prophets. He make a statement like this. It is written. Why, why would Jesus make a statement like this? He remembered the law and the prophets. Meaning that Jesus allowed the law and the prophets to shepherd him. And so suddenly he, 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 he disappeared from the earth. Here stands his disciples. Same thing. They said when he was here, he was saying this and this. So again, they allow the words of Jesus in the absence of Jesus to, 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 to shepherd them. And then you have this man, Paul. He died thousands of years. But you, without knowing it, you still allow the words of Paul to shepherd you. You are saying, Apostle Paul was saying this and this. Apostle Paul had so and so said. By making that statement, you are actually saying you allow, still allow the words of Paul to shepherd us. So this church, 2016, we must grow up. Otherwise, we're going to delay God because God's infancy is something that will be confronted in the new season. Infancy. You can't be 20 years with the Lord and still in the crying room. You complain just like a new convert. We can't, we, we can't have that anymore. That's foolishness. In the 20 years with the Lord, you complain just like a new convert. Huh? And God, God, God is about to deal with these things in his church. He will not allow 20-year believers to be in the crying room in the church anymore. Uh, because you are going to delay the body of Christ. You're going to delay the body of Christ. We must move on to maturity. We must move on. And when I say, I'm going, just going to give you quickly scriptures or maybe read it for you to, to see how the apostles look at infancy. Uh, uh, Colossians 1 verse 28. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect or mature in Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 14, that we may be no longer be infants, being tossed as by waves and being carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in regard to the deceitful scheming. And then 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 4, and I, brothers was not able to speak to you as to spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink and not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, neither are you now yet uh, able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal uh, and walking according to human principles? For when one says, I am of Paul, and the other, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Now, quick, the, the characteristics of, uh, of infancy is this. The inability to coexist with others. The inability to coexist with others. Living, number two, living by individualistic principles of this world as opposed to communal principles of the kingdom. Number three, High levels of giftedness coupled with underdeveloped character. And that was the Corinthians problems. I don't want to go in. I don't have time to go into this. We are gifted, but we don't have character. Yeah. Miles Monroe, late Mr. Miles Monroe, he said that the charismatic season is only converted from the head to the waist, from the waist down was they not converted. <laughs> Number four, the inability to have a well-developed kingdom expression. As long as these characteristics still define church, then we know that we have not come to a place of maturity. Our maturity includes personal uh, maturity, relational maturity, and doctrinal maturity. Uh, grace <laughs> and peace be with you. God bless you. Amen.